So we're going to talk today to Professor Christophe Jaffrelot, a French political scientist, Indologist, uh, who teaches at Cian's Po. Uh, Professor Jaffrelot is an authority on South Asian history and politics, and he has written over 20 books on India and Pakistan and various other parts of South Asia. His most recent book, Gujarat Under Modi, has been just released by Context India. And today we are going to talk to him about this book, uh, the main crux of which is the argument that uh, Narendra Modi's tenure as chief minister of Gujarat held certain patterns, not just at the policy level, but also at the recruitment level, at the social conditioning level, that he then later replicated uh, during his two terms as prime minister of India. Uh, so we are very happy to welcome Professor Jaffrelo. First thing which I want to ask you, Professor, is at the beginning of the book, you make it clear that the caste equations as well as the relation to Islam that we observe in Gujarat is very, very different from the same caste relations or the same interface with Islam that North Indians would be familiar with or people in South Indian states like Tamil Nadu or Karnataka would be familiar with. Could you explain to our audience briefly how this um, mathematics or how these equations are different in Gujarat, what makes it unique? Yes, well, each state has its own caste system. Uh, of course, the Indie Belt uh, is more than one state. It's a larger Meta region, and therefore it, tem it tends to be the, the reference point. We tend to define the caste system by applying uh, the Indie Belt kind of pattern. But Gujarat is different, definitely. Uh, different, first of all, because... Um, Certainly, Brahmins play a big role, but historically, uh, Vaish, Banyas, have been very influential, very powerful, and therefore uh, have tilted somewhat the caste system in their favor. When I say Banya, by the way, I mean Hindu Banya as well as Ve Jain, because as you know, uh, there are many uh, Jain people in, in Gujarat. So that's one. The other big difference is we've seen something unique in Gujarat. We've seen the making of a caste coalition. Even more than that, you can say the fusion, the merging of two castes uh, or caste groups. One, Rajputs, which were very influential in Katyavar, uh, in the place we know now uh, uh, Saurashtra, uh, and uh, another one, the Kohli's, which were, uh, if you want, OBCs, lower caste, but very numerous. And in the 40s, we see the convergence of these two caste groups, which finally merged to create another group known as the Kshatriyas. And they merged uh, to resist the Patels, to resist the Patidars, who had become very influential in the context of the land reform. So you have a kind of fluidity. It is This is a reflection of a kind of fluidity that is very important. And uh, it's a reflection also, of course, of caste conflicts. You have the upper castes, you have the Patels, you have the Kshatriyas and the OBCs at large. These are three major players Dalits are not so active in Gujarat, and there is no Ambedkarite movement worth that name today. And Adivasis are also uh, not so well uh, structured. So we've had this kind of um, yeah, mathematics, as you say, arithmetic of caste, and that explains a lot of the uh, Gujarati trajectory in politics, primarily because under the pressure of the Kshatriyas, we gradually saw a demand for reservations that culminated in the 80s in the making of the Kam coalition and reservations implemented by, um, well, Mr. Solanke, uh, who played such a major part in uh, Gujarat politics. And in that sense, Gujarat was the first state before before Mandal, 10 years before Mandal, to initiate a trajectory that also resulted in a reaction 
on the Indudva side, from the Indudva side. The dialectic between caste politics and Indudva politics crystallized in Gujarat first. Right. Uh, that is really helpful, uh, Professor. And, uh, you know, during the lead up to the election results that happened just a few days ago, uh, I was reading your book uh, in the week uh, leading up to the results. And when I was reading the portion about how Modi saffronized the police forces and many other institutions in Gujarat, uh, it was all uh, it is all sounding very, very significant because at, during the same week, the election commission at the center was being accused by the public at large and by the media of favoring the Modi and it, uh, or favoring the Modi government. And so, this is one of them. Uh, this pillar, I call it the capture of institutions, and police is the first that has been captured. Of course, in a very specific context. No, this is after the pogrom. So post-pogrom Gujarat was a scene where police played a major role. And it was key for Narendra Modi to make sure that uh, there would be no proper investigation. Uh, and the policemen who were likely to investigate, uh, the policemen who had tried to do their job during the pogrom, the professional policemen, were sidelined almost systematically. When those who had played the right game, quote unquote, were promoted. And this is the beginning of a process of politicization of the police that will also find expression in a series of fake encounters. You know, after 2003, between 10, 2003 and 2006, 2007, you have a series of more than a dozen of fake encounters. And the police played a key role, of course, in fake encounters. Uh, someone like Von Zara, for instance, played a key role in, in this. And the idea was the same. The idea was to polarize. By the way, polarization is the first pillar of this, of this system. To polarize by other means. You accuse young Muslims to come from Pakistan or to be trained by uh, jihadi groups based in Pakistan to assassinate the chief minister. And you eliminate them. Uh, Sorabuddin is one of them. There are many others. Uh, and, and give a press conference saying, well, we have saved the prime minister, the chief minister from an attack and here are the guilty men uh, and, and we had to kill them because they were running away or whatever. So the police played a big role there. Uh, as you may remember, something like 20 policemen were sent to jail because of these practices, including Banzara. And uh, this is one symptom of our police has, had been captured uh, by, by the government. And don't forget that at that time, the Minister, Minister of State for Home is, is, is Amit Shah himself. You know, you mentioned that uh, the caste politics of Gujarat is very different uh, from the other states. And during the beginning of the book, you mentioned how there has always been a historical trend of the upper castes in Gujarat uh, intermarrying with intermediate castes in large numbers. Uh, and yet there is also this phenomenon of the lower castes, uh, and not just Dalits, but also intermediate castes, uh, actively participating in anti-Muslim pogroms. Uh, even, even when there is a clear-cut hierarchy, when, 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 when the treatment of Dalits, and specifically with regards to human rights, Gujarat has a terrible record on that, uh, despite that they are partaking in Modi's um, sort of anti-Muslim project or the anti-Muslim part of his Gujarat model, if you will. Uh, how do you explain this sort of, uh, superficially it might look like a contradiction, but as you explain in the book, it's not. So if you could uh, just briefly explain that. Well, this is, of course, part of the famous dialectic between caste politics and Indunva politics. The more caste politics asserts itself, the more reservations you have, the more radical polarization has to be 
to precisely diffuse these social tensions. You need more indudva for telling the poor, for telling the lower caste people, oh, your main enemy is not the upper caste. Your main enemy is the Muslim. So you have to use communalization of society for maintaining social hierarchy, for maintaining uh, the uh, domination of the upper caste. This is exactly what you saw in the 80s when in 1985, a riot that was opposing low caste Hindus and upper caste Hindus, including Patels, was hijacked or was transformed into a riot between Hindus and Muslims. 85 is really a laboratory. At that time, of course, Narendra Modi is organizing secretary of uh, the Gujarat BJP and plays a key role uh, in, in this. Why, how does that work? Why does it work? Why do Dalits shift from the caste repertoire to the communal repertoire? Well, this is where the work of the Sangh Parivar is so important. Number one, Sanskritization. You make sure that you bring low caste people, Dalits especially, on the right side by um, working with them at the grassroots level, making them feeling more Hindu and uh, giving them some recognition. Number two, you have, of course, um, the attraction of looting, of making some um, money out of communal um, conflicts. And, uh, and that's something that was clearly there even before, even in the 69 riot, you have this socioeconomic dimension. You know, Dalit, in, in, Dalit Hindus attacking Muslims because they were accused of uh, taking their jobs in the factories at a time when there was a big problem for the textile mills, cotton mills especially. So there is a socioeconomic dimension that has to be factored in. And third, of course, there is such a lack of unity and political consciousness among low caste uh, actors, players, especially in Gujarat. As, as I've said, Ambedkarism is very shallow. There is no BSP. There was hardly any RPI. You know, it's it makes things easier uh, for uh, criminal forces. Professor, I'm just going to slightly backpedal towards one of your earlier books. Uh, I believe it was called uh, Hindutva, a reader. Uh, this was uh, in the mid 2000s sometimes. And yeah. uh, I, I had the chance to read that book uh, many years ago. I, I sort of remember there was a section there in which... Uh, we talk about the social part of the Hindutva laboratory, not just the legal wing or of influencing uh, institutions like the police force. But if we focus on the social part, I remember uh, there were portions in that book which talked about uh, entities like the Arya Samaj who uh, tried to foment the social unrest by spreading anti-Islam pamphlets. I believe there was one called Rangila Rasul that you spoke about in particular during that book. Uh, what what was the analogous sort of social part of this lab experiment, if you will, in Gujarat? Or was the Arya Samaj also involved in Gujarat as well? No, Arya Samaj was not there in Gujarat, even though <laughs> you may know that Swami Dayanand Sarasvati, the founder of Arya Samaj, was a Gujarati. Yes, I, I went in... to a DAV school myself in childhood, so all of this was force-fed to me. <laughs> so you know the story. Uh, interestingly, Arya Samaj did not make any inroad in Gujarat. Uh, in Gujarat, the, the really strong uh, Hindu religious movement was the Swami Narayan. Uh, Swami Narayan temples are the largest temples in Gujarat these days, for instance, and, uh, and they have attracted Patels in very large numbers. So it's a different story, but uh, and it's a different story also from the point of view you raise, that is a social dimension. Because Arya Samaj was somewhat a reformist movement, helping 
the plebeians to get some recognition, the Shuddhi movement, for instance, that they initiated, was a way to to bring Dalits in the in mainstream of Hinduism. Well, you find that in the Hindutva movement in Gujarat, but um, with an attempt at keeping the social hierarchy that is much more assertive. You know, Hindutva as a subtext, social status quo. And that's not something so clear on the Arya Samaji side, where social reform was was more important. But social status quo in the case of um, Gujarat was something Patels valued a lot. Now, Patels, remember, were on the Congress side for decades. Uh, Vallabhbhai Patel From being the 60s to the 90s. Exactly. And then they shifted. And they shifted in the 90s because of the anti-reservation movement they wanted to be part of. So they were against social transformation. They were for social status quo. Right, right. And that's why they shifted to the BGP from, from Congress. You know, when you talk about uh, the decentralization of power, uh, the way Modi took away law enforcement powers from uh, the police or the way he took away, uh, you know, supervisory powers from watchdog bodies. Did you see echoes of that happening, especially in the second term of Modi at the center and how? Yes, um, we saw that indeed um, gradually um, in Gujarat with more institutions being captured. Number one, uh, the police. Number two, the judiciary with one clear attempt at uh, infiltrating the judiciary and appointing prosecutors who would come from the RSS galaxy. Other institutions, of course, shifted as well, and the bureaucracy is one of them. You know, Gujarat cutters, IES cutters, were promoted. <laughs> Some of them have moved to Delhi, by the way. You have an amazing continuity in terms of who are the people who were there in Gujarat, who are now here in, in Delhi. Uh, in the case of the bureaucrats, there is something very interesting that has been unnoticed. Um, a kind of new nexus with the business milieu. Now, Gujarat is, of course, the place where you have the largest number of industrialists, the, number, number, the largest number of uh, businessmen per capita, if you want. And uh, the connection between the state and the business milieu have always been there. And, and Shiman Bhai Patel was a good example of this osmosis. Under Modi, it took a new turn. The state and only few businessmen became really uh, in a kind of osmosis. And the promotion of some oligarchs started there. You know, again, a continuity. Gautam Adani started to become a very important supporter for Modi as early as 2003, when, when he was on the defensive, when the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, attacked him, uh, Mr. Godrej, uh, Mr. Bajaj, telling him that's not what uh, we should do uh, in Gujarat. Uh, this, these riots are very bad for, for the state, very bad for business. So me, Gautam Adani came to his rescue at that time and, and, and created a group of supporters. He was paid back very soon afterwards, uh, offered a, a special economic zone in Mundra for a, a port, and, and bureaucrats helped. And they helped because the state asked them to help they helped by shifting to the public, to the private sector as well. So you have a kind of circulation of bureaucrats from the state apparatus to the private sector. That is clearly a way to capture the bureaucracy, to capture the 
the, the, the administration. So it's not only the police, it's not only the judiciary, it's also the administration that has been transformed in the process. And uh, even today, you have uh, this very large number of bureaucrats used uh, by the BGP. Well, so many of them in, in the government, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar in the first place, you know, former uh, IFS officers. Uh, and that started in Gujarat, that, that technique of merging two kinds of social groups, so to speak, uh, or sociologies, uh, was initiated in uh, in in the Gujarat model, quote unquote, that was uh, Modi's Gujarat. You have a kind of blurring of the border, the frontier between the private sphere and the state, and 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 the state loses its autonomy in some in some ways. It's it's not a neutral referee. This is what we see today. And the uh, Indian embassies across the world are playing a, a, a part that is ideological, for instance, uh, not neutral. The state is not neutral anymore. Right. Uh, you know, sir, recently uh, I watched a film which was originally a 70s film, but it has now been re-released in India. It's called Manthan by Sham Benegal. And it's a fictionalized version of the Amul story in Gujarat. And uh, because this film is a fantasy, uh, towards the end, we are shown that all the Dalit villagers, they sort of get together and they take control of the cooperative and the fruits of liberalization are shared by one and all, uh, you know, irrespective of caste and class and so on. In reality, we know that Dr. Varghis Kurian uh, ended up consolidating the powerful partidars of the region because of which Amul was able to be a thing at all. But I found the nature of the fantasy very instructive indeed, because it sort of suggests that the opposite of that is happening. Yes, the cooperative movement is very important in Gujarat. Amul is only one of many cooperatives. But I think we should use the past tense there. It was very important. You know, the cooperative movement first of all, played a major role in the freedom movement, um, giving um, self-help uh, as a recipe. Uh, and it retained a, a lot of importance um, during the first decades of independent India. Congress relied a lot on the network of cooperatives. And I mean, I realized that in the book, I, I, I explain how and when um, and started to capture this institution, one more. <laughs> that was even before they took over power. That's It started before. Uh, it was, of course, fully accomplished after they took over power, but it was initiated before. And interestingly, the cooperatives Amit Shah was the most interested in were the banks, cooperative banks, that they finally... Um, Took over from, and uh, uh, in the case of Amul and other cooperatives, they resisted more for a longer period. But finally, you saw that yes, they took over also from most of them. Uh, it was part of a very significant uh, objective. They wanted to get power at the local level which means that they had to control the cooperatives, they had to control the municipal corporations, they had to control the uh, panchayats as well. Janpad panchayats, um, district boards, and so on. And, um, you know, again, this is something we see at the national level now, but we could see it at the Gujarat level then. Narendra Modi canvassed to win municipal elections. Where do you see a chief minister spending so much time to win local elections. Modi did it, realizing that he needed to have this kind of uh, implantation at the local level. And uh, he succeeded in winning Rashkot Municipal, Municipal Corporation, 1983, Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, 1985. And at the same time, gradually, he made inroads in the villages as well. So cooperatives on the one hand, local bodies on the other hand, were part of the same plan 
to to get really deep roots at, at the local level. Right. Uh, now, sir, you mentioned in the introduction that, you know, this book had been completed around 10 years ago. Uh, and that, you know, in the intervening 10 years, several publishers had written to you that this, oh, this is not the right time to release the book. Uh, we feared that it might run into legal trouble. Did you feel a sense of poetic justice that the book book's timing has sort of coincided with what seems to be the weakening of Modi's empire? Well, I did not know that uh, there would be any weakening uh, when uh, the book was finally published a couple of months ago. Um, well, what I feel is a relief. You know, I've written this book uh, over 20 years. Well, I've worked on that book over 20 years. I've been to Gujarat every year, twice, thrice, since, in fact, 2001. My first, my first visit was after the earthquake. Uh, of uh, January uh, 2001. And I amassed information. I gathered data for 20 years. My last visit was 2020. Now I'm really relieved that this is there for the record. And uh, if the context, if the circumstances allow people to speak about it more than I would have anticipated. It's a bonus. Uh, and, uh, of course, another relief. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so just uh, as a parting question, I would ask you, now that Modi has a severely depleted majority and he is dependent upon uh, regional state parties uh, for the survival of his government, what are some of the things that the opposition, and I'm not just talking about the Congress here, but also the regional parties, what should they do to ensure that this momentum is taken forward and that uh, Modi is finally unseated from power? Well, first of all, they must use the parliament. You know, parliament was a echo chamber for many years, incidentally, the same way the Vidhan Sabha of uh, Gujarat was an echo chamber. The same pattern applied. Uh, the prime minister is never there in the Lok Sabha or parliament. Uh, the chief minister, Narendra Modi, was not there either. Uh, and and, and uh, we have again a, a comparison to make. Now, the opposition is very well represented in the Lok Sabha. And the first thing they should do is to use this institution to bring it back to what it was. You must have parliamentary committees. You must uh, see uh, the uh, bills in advance. You must negotiate uh, for amendments to be taken into account. That's the first thing. That's, uh, I would say, in terms of modus operandi. The substance why why are you what are you using the parliament for well for promoting the issues they have raised the opposition during the election campaign inequalities the peasants condition joblessness um attacks on federalism federalism should be back to what it was. And of course, autonomy of the institutions, you know, the, the ED, the CBI, the election commission, you know, all of them should be uh, restored to their uh, original uh, status. It may not be sufficient. And therefore, I consider that it cannot be only in the political domain that the opposition has to work. You know, it's also as a social movement. And uh, it's even more important to, to, to have a vibrant civil society now that it is exactly um, at that level that the Song Parivar has made its own uh, inroads. You know, Song Parivar is there with vigilante groups, with student unions, 
uh, trade unions, peasant unions. This is the domain the opposition should invest also. Uh, and and the situation is very most I would say conducive to that. You know, we have had a farmers movement for many years, and it is it is still there uh, clearly. Can it be given a kind of sense of direction nationally? Similarly, um, we have uh, this protest against the CA that was also almost a national protest, re showing that minorities were living in fear, Muslims were living in fear in particular. Um, how do you channelize this, this energy? You know, Muslims have been taken for granted during these elections. Everybody knew that they would vote for the opposition. So why should you give them tickets? Why should you give them any recognition? Well, they need to be recognized as the main casualty of the regime. So to organize these people as well should be at the social level, uh, probably part of uh, the opposition's agenda. And last but not least, they should stay united. They should stay united because this is the condition for being uh, efficient. Uh, they may, they may because they still have a common adversary and that helps. What we probably will see, at least what the opposition should work in was would be to, to bring those who are still outside of the India uh, grouping to join this grouping. Um, um, Mayavati should not be afraid as much as she was anymore. Navid Patnayak must have realized that the kind of strategy he followed was self-defeating. Well, you have you have few groups of that kind, few parties of that kind who are still outside and who probably will realize that this is the only way. You know, this is something we see everywhere. Look at Turkey against Erdogan. You have to bring a coalition with parties who are poles apart, who have nothing in common except the need to dislodge the strong man from power. We've seen this in so many other parts, Poland, Hungary, Israel. So the coalition needs to be very large. It can be still larger, active in parliament, active in the street, active in the villages, and uh, they must build a, a positive agenda. It, it should not be only against what is there. It should be for something ambitious and the potential is there because they have, they have a real program, you know, social economic reforms, social reforms, the caste census, among others, uh, should be an important um, uh, item in this program. And if they do that, we may see uh, that the worst is never for sure. Right. I hope the opposition is listening to these very wise words. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for talking to me today, Professor. And I hope that uh, people read this book uh, and, and see the lessons that it has, uh, not only for Gujarat, but for the rest of the country as well. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Christoph Jafrilov, for your time today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aditya.